Hey guys, Professor Gooden here, and in this video we'll be talking about bivariate regression, otherwise known as simple regression. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, Professor of Kinesiology at Point Loma Nazarene University, and in this video we'll be talking about an extension of correlation known as simple regression, or in a fancier terms, bivariate regression. And this concept essentially allows us to predict one variable from another variable if there is a sufficiently strong correlation between them. Let's dive right in and check it out. Now this comes from chapter eight of the textbook Statistics in Kinesiology by Drs. Vincent and Ware. So the entire purpose of bivariate regression is to predict one variable from another variable. So usually the, the predicted variable is something that's hard to measure, like a VO2 max. A VO2 max requires expensive, fancy equipment. You need some sort of expert who knows how to run said expensive, fancy equipment. You usually need one or two helpers, and then you need some poor soul who has volunteered for this study um, or if you're in grad school, they've been voluntold by you to be part of your study, um, who will be running on the treadmill with a mask strapped to their face and a clip on their nose, and they're unable to get off because they have a bunch of people shouting at them, AKA encouraging them to do their best and to get a, a full result, which means going to almost failure while running on this treadmill at increasingly faster and uh, speeds and higher inclines. So that's really tough to do. What you could do instead is do is perform a one and a half mile run all out. So it's still tough, but so much easier, way less setup than a VO2 max. You go to your local track and you have the person run six laps and then and time them for it. And the reason we can do that is because there has been research that has looked at the correlation between 1.5 mile runtime and VO2 max. And they have established a bivariate regression equation so that you can plug in your 1.5 mile runtime and it spits out a resulting VO2 max. Another example is skin fold thickness to predict body fat percentage. Now we can use a seven site skin fold, eight site, three site skin fold, even a one site skin fold to predict your body fat percentage. Now the only reason we can use skin fold thicknesses to predict body fat percentage is because research has looked at actual body fat percentage measured by the gold standard a DEXA scan and it has compared that using correlation to skin fold thickness at a variety of locations. The original research that was actually used to develop these equations was pretty gruesome and it involved cadavers and it involved stripping all the fat off the bodies and putting it in buckets and weighing it and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's kind of nasty. But essentially now we have the ability to estimate somebody's body fat just by pinching their skin and measuring it. So let's say for example that we test a group of athletes max push-ups and also their hand grip endurance. And so here in the X column we have the number of push-ups they can do and in the Y column we have the number of seconds that they can sustain a certain amount of isometric force on a hand grip dynamometer. So we run the analysis and we get a regression equation and we can use that regression equation, which we'll see how to calculate here in a minute, to get a predicted Y value. Now this predicted Y value is based on their X value and the correlation between that X and the Y variables. Now column number four is the deviation in X from the mean and column five are deviations in the predicted y versus the actual y. Now columns six through seven are calculations of what we call the sum of squares, and these will become important as we'll see later. We have an error sum of square, a total sum of square, and a regression sum of square. And those actually are related to each other. We see that the total sum of squares is equal to the regression plus the error sum of squares but you are not supposed to understand that yet. You will understand that hopefully in the coming slides. So here's what it looks like if we graph these push-ups versus the hand grip endurance. So we see push-ups here on the X and we see time to failure 
on the Y for hand grip endurance, and notice that we've plotted this line of best fit through the points. Now the line of best fit is that line that averages out and reduces, it minimizes the amount of deviation or residual between each point and the line. So let's say we wanted to try to predict how, how long somebody could hold their hand grip endurance if they could do 40 push-ups. So we look at 40 push-ups and we go up from there to the line and then we go over and we see that well, it's about 40 seconds. So based on this scatter plot, we would predict that somebody who could do 40 push-ups could squeeze that hand grip dynamometer for about 40 seconds until failure at the given strength requirement. Now, let's say that that individual actually did 40 push-ups, but maybe they've been working on their grip strength. Maybe they're a climber or something. Climbers, you know, they just train their back and biceps because they're always pulling. They're never really pushing and they have phenomenal grip strength. So let's say that instead this, this person was off the charts and they did, let's say 65 seconds, well then that would be a pretty big residual. The residual would be 25 in this case. Now the residual is just the difference between the actual Y value and the predicted Y value. Now some other things to note on this graph, the slope of this line is the change in X over the change in Y. And in this case, it's 0.725 seconds per push-up. So for every extra push-up that you can do, it's predicted that you can hold the hand grip dynamometer and squeeze it for about 0.725 extra seconds. So let's say that I increase my push-up strength from 40 to 45. Well, based on this prediction, uh, I would have five times 0.725 seconds more on my time to failure for the hand grip dynamometer. So let's say that we calculate that the Pearson R correlation coefficient is 0.845 and the 95% confidence interval is from R equals 0 .9, uh, 0.59 to 0.95 for push-ups versus hand grip strength on the uh, isometric endurance test. Now we can use these values as well as the standard deviation to calculate a regression equation. And that's here. And this is also an equation of a line. It's specifically the equation of the line of best fit that we looked at in the scatter plot. So this always takes the form in bivariate regression or simple regression of y equals a plus bx. So a is the y-intercept, which we saw was I think about 13. Yep, about 13 seconds right here. And B is the slope of the line. So let's see how to calculate those. So we calculate B by multiplying the correlation coefficient by the standard deviation of Y over the standard deviation of X. And we calculate A by inserting that same equation that we just looked at and multiplying it by X and subtracting that whole thing from y. And we can simplify that down to the mean of y minus b times the mean of x. So let's plug in our numbers. Remember that 0.845 was the correlation coefficient. And we calculated the standard deviation, not in this lecture, but let's say that we calculated that the standard deviation was 10.56 seconds for y and 12.5 31 push-ups for X. So that gives us a B of 0.725 seconds per push-up. That's the slope of the line. And then to calculate A, we plug B in down here, and we multiply that by the average of the push-ups and subtract it from the average of the seconds for the hand grip hold. And we get 12.93 seconds. So then, the resulting equation becomes 12.93 seconds plus 0.725 seconds per push-up or simplified down to y predicted equals 12.93 plus 0.725 times x. So all you have to do is then perform a push-up test, get your max push-up score, plug it into x, and then you have your predicted hand grip to failure 
score. So if you do 58 push-ups and then you plug it in down here, then you should be able to squeeze that hand grip dynamometer at the appropriate level for about 54.98 seconds, give or take. Because remember that the prediction is not perfect. There will most likely be some positive or negative residual. And we call this the error in the prediction. Remember that the error or the residual is determined by the vertical distance between the actual data point and the line of best fit. So for example, again, if X is 58 push-ups, then the predicted Y is 55 seconds. But if the actual Y was only 51 seconds, then that's a negative four second residual. Now in the data set, all the negative and positive residuals will cancel each other out because the line of best fit is the line that minimizes the residual between all the data points. So if the residuals didn't cancel out, then that means that the line of best fit didn't actually fit very well and we need to adjust it. Now we can quantify the amount of error in any data set using standard error of the estimate or SEE. SEE has somewhat of a more complex formula, but you can think of it as a type of standard deviation. In this case, standard deviation of the residuals or of the errors between the predicted values and the actual values. And it will be in the units of the dependent variable. So the SEE is kind of like the SEM or the standard error of the mean. Remember the standard error of the mean allows us to predict a confidence interval around a calculated mean so that we can infer it to the general population. The SEE does the same thing, but in this case for a uh, prediction. So the SEE allows us to predict an interval of Y scores where we think the Y scores from the population will fall given any value of X. So for example, we want to predict time to failure if an individual does 60 push-ups. So we plug that in and we get 56.4 seconds to failure in the hand grip test. Well, if we want to calculate the error, then we multiply the standard error of the estimate, which we calculated on the previous slide to be 6.06 .06 by 1.96. And that should look familiar as the point uh, just below two standard deviations above and below the mean that contains 95% of all the data on a normally distributed um, curve. Okay, so if we multiply the SEE by 1.96 and we add and subtract that from our predicted value, then we get 44.5 to 68.3. So we can say with 95% certainty that if an individual can do 60 push-ups, then that means that they can squeeze that hand grip dynamometer uh, for 44.5 seconds all the way up to maybe 68.3 seconds before they fail. And we are 95% certain that that will be the case. So the general equation for that is the Y predicted equals the intercept plus the slope of the line times the score plus or minus the uh, level of confidence, which we represent with Z, times the standard error of the estimate. So let's say that we've run the correlation, we've created a scatter plot, we've even created our bivariate regression model, and we have a formula for predicting the Y variable based on the X variable. Well, we also need to determine the statistical significance of B and construct a confidence interval around B. So if you've already done this for R, if you say ran a correlation as well as your bivariate regression, it's really gonna be the same thing because remember that your bivariate regression only works because your two variables are correlated. And so we're essentially using the same process to answer two different questions when we're using a correlation versus a bivariate regression. A correlation asks, what is the relationship between these two variables? And bivariate regression asks, can we predict one variable from another variable? And how do we do that? So in this case, we will use what is called 
a T statistic. This is similar to a Z score, so it's a form of standardized score, but the distribution has thicker tails. So instead of being normally distributed, it has, and let's say here's X and there's nice thin tails on that normal distribution, a T distribution has thicker tails. So it's maybe something like this. And it's more accurate with small sample sizes. So in this case, T is going to equal B, remember B is the slope of the line, over SE of B. And remember, the SE of B is the standard error of the estimate. Now, I'm not going to run through all of these calculations to determine the confidence interval by hand because it does get pretty confusing. But what we need to know is that the better the prediction of Y based on X, the smaller the standard error will be of B. And the smaller the standard error, then the larger the T statistic. And if that T statistic gets large enough, then we would reject the null hypothesis. So to calculate a confidence interval, we would set the confidence interval equal to B plus or minus the T statistic times the standard error of B. And using a program like SPSS, we would determine that a 95% confidence interval in this case would equal 0.725, remember that was equal to B that we calculated earlier, plus 2.16 times 0.127 which equals 0.44 to 0.99. So that is the confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval for the slope of B. And no, we didn't calculate it by hand or really show all of the steps of calculation, but this is because rarely will we calculate this by hand. If you're looking for a confidence interval for bivariate regression or for your uh, correlation coefficients, these can all be done in a stats program. So in reporting this, we would be saying that B equals 0.725 seconds per push-up, with a 95% confidence interval equal to 0.44 to 0.99 seconds per push-up. This means that we are 95% confident that the population slope is somewhere between 0.44 to 0.99 seconds. To summarize, bivariate regression or simple regression analysis can be used to predict a Y variable from a known X variable if there's an established correlation between the two. In order to find that correlation, you need to collect both sets of data on a group of subjects and then calculate an equation for the slope of the line as well as the Y intercept for that data set. Once you find that and have established that it's statistically significant, uh, meaning that the confidence interval does not contain zero, then you can apply it to the rest of the population with some degree of error. If they have some sort of score for X, whether that's push-ups or whether that's a 1.5 mile run, whatever it is that you're comparing, then you can predict their score for Y. So thanks for joining me in this video. Stick around for more statistics lectures or head over to my channel for other kinesiology concepts related to anatomy or strength and conditioning or sports science. And I'll see you guys on the next video. Good job, buddy. Good job, mama.